much singing. You may be seated. It was two years ago this Sunday, in fact, for the first time in my life, I met Jack and Nell Chen Chen. I had no idea who they were. I knew they were friends of, of um, Hansi and... Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And they were sitting right here with them this morning in the first service. They um, have such a blessing to this church too. Jack and Nell came and just, uh, just in five minutes less, two years ago, they just absolutely overwhelmed me. I have a great admiration for these people. Jack's a businessman, a very successful businessman. Uh, he's a, you, oh, I don't want to preach your sermon, Jack. You, you will tell us about your military experience. Um, but Jack and Nell, I'll tell, you the, I'll tell you the thing that really gets me about these people. They've got an incredible family. They've raised a large family of children. All of their children, first of all, are serving the Lord. That's the important thing. Several of them are in Africa today, in the, involved in the work you're going to hear about. Another son's pastoring a great church in Phoenix. Uh, these, these are people of quality and character. And I want to tell you, when I get around people like them, I'm humbled. And I feel like I'm in the presence of spiritual nobility. And you will feel that as well today. When they were here last time, and I told them today, I've, we've got to make this available. And probably nobody's saying amen more than Paul Keno. Because uh, Paul, Paul saw that all of his grandkids were at this book. Yeah, it, it, it's such a book of faith. Uh, you better start in the morning because you can't go to bed till you get rid of it. It is a powerful book of faith. And Nancy and I absolutely love this book. And so I said, did you bring it now? They said, she said, did you want me to? I have to go to the car. So they're out there and Nell will be out there. You must, you must get a hold of this book today. The Yankee Officer and the Southern Belle. May I ask the Southern Belle to please stand and look at these folks just so they know <laughs> who the Southern Belle is. And after this, there she is. And you are going to hear from the Yankee officer this morning. A man that is, the man that is visionary, a man that has touched this world. And you're going to hear a message today that probably one of the greatest missionary sermons I ever heard in my life. Jack, I could talk about you all day. I love you. Thank you for being with us today. Will you please welcome Dr. Jack Chin Chin. Thank you. You know, when we were here two years ago, we were blown away <laughs> when we came here. You know, I thought in a retirement center, <laughs> you know, everybody's going to be laid back, and uh, it didn't work out that way at all. I have, and I've told your pastor this, we've been in hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of churches, but I can honestly say, I don't think we have been in a church like this that has been this excited about everything. I mean, you, you sing with the excitement. But when it comes to missions, it, it's fantastic the response that there is here in this church. Not just because of us. It's, it's all across the board what you do. And so it's a privilege for Nell and myself to be back again. And this time to be able to preach. Last time I gave a report. This time I'm bringing you a message. And it's a message you need to hear. Um, I want to say this before, and I have to say it before, whenever I speak. Uh, it's been Nell and myself together through all these 45 years in Africa. And longer, much longer than that in our marriage. It's, we've done everything together. No one can take any uh, credit for anything. It's been the both of us and the Lord. And without him, there would have been nothing. But with him, the two of us together, it's been marvelous, miraculous. That's why that book is such an interesting book. 
you live a miraculous life in Christ when you're together like that doing the Great Commission let's pray Father thank you again for this time here at Friendship Church and certainly that is a great name for this church it's such a warm heart for so many things and for so many ways and continue to bless them uh, as they serve you here by serving the mission field all across the board out there thank you and now before we enter into your word we ask that your spirit be present in a very special way because we know that your holy spirit has done does many things for us and through us and in us but one thing he does so well is to open up your word and make it clear to us without him we wouldn't understand much with him we can understand everything so lord do be with us help us to open this scripture before us and to understand it and react to it and we ask in Jesus' name, amen. You know, for months, um, you folks, along with Nell and myself, have been watching the ribbons go across the television set down at the bottom there. Um, and also CNN with the breaking news all about this Ebola plague that has... Um, invaded West Africa and we are afraid we we're, we're not so much anymore but at the beginning we were afraid it was going to hit us here in America well Nell and I were there in Liberia when this broke out last March and we stayed there with it it sort of dwindled off a little bit before we left we held the graduation and so forth and then came back to the United States and then all of a sudden it broke out in a horrible forest fire way and we weren't able to return and we had to close down the college all the schools in Liberia all the schools in West Africa are closed along with a lot of other things but by God's grace I didn't mention that the first service we're going to be back there in August I want you to be praying about that because we're going to hope that they've conquered this thing by then and we're going to be able to open up again and raise up these Christian leaders that they more desperately need that needed now than they did a year ago because so much has been disrupted and turned back so we do be praying for us that we'll be able to get back there and open that college in August um, I, I would say this before I get into the message um, as that stuff was going across the screen on this horror in, uh, in, in Liberia and in Sierra Leone and in Guinea I thought you know that those are just the birth pains of Africa because so there's what should be flashing across the, that screen uh, is is God's kingdom is expanding is exploding I have to say it's exploding in Africa like nowhere else in the in the world that that's that's big that's major that ought to be going across the screen down there you know this continent that, that all these things happen to but they're growing pains because they are expanding in a way that it's not no other continent in this world is expanding for Christ and at the at the bottom it ought to have down there our, our breaking news on CNN that's where it belongs uh, Africa has a great God given destiny 99% of the people don't know that and um, they don't know it's in the Bible that's why I'm gonna take you in there because it's not me saying this it's God's Word saying this this infallible Word of God this word of truth by Isaiah the greatest prophet who prophesied all about Jesus before he ever came prophesying that Africa of all places is going to have this great God-given destiny I don't read anything there for America England China but it's there for Africa so we're going to get into that and um, 
Before we do, I want to have a word of prayer. I prayed already. I want to say, just Lord, lift this up. Help us to have ears to hear, hearts to receive. And we pray in Christ's name. Amen. When I went to Africa 45 years ago, when we went, and four of our seven children with us to Liberia back in 1970, uh, I didn't know this. I, I had no idea that Africa had a destiny. I was there because God called, and I want to take the gospel out and help people to understand the Bible. But I had no idea that Africa had a great destiny. And I hadn't been there a week when I wish I had known about this. Because I was walking down Broad Street, the main street in Monrovia. And this fellow came up alongside of me and matched me stride for stride. And we walked that way for quite a while before anybody said anything. And then he said to me, in a very angry voice, You missionary? And I wasn't sure I wanted to say yes or not. And finally I mumbled, I'm a missionary. And then he said to me, Why you missionaries take so long to come here? Why Africa last? I didn't have an answer. I didn't have an answer. And I walked away from him. And that really bothered me after that. If I had known then what I know today, I would have come back to him and said, my friend, God loves you so much that he has saved you until last. You know, Jesus said, the last shall be first and the first shall be last. These are the least of all people in most people's eyes. And, and he's saving you for last. You're his dessert. You're the sweet thing he's going to have on his mouth when the end comes. You're God's dessert. That's what I would have said. And that's the truth. That's the way it is when you read this. Well, two years went by. And in that time, our bamboo house that we lived in up on stilts burned down. And uh, when our bamboo house burned down, it's less than five minutes. And we lost everything we had, only what we had on our back. But you know, it, it, for the, we, the, the, the natives around there, uh, the people have been coming to us for everything. Now as the tables were turned and they were coming to help us, give us things that we needed to get by and stay out there. And there was a bond made out of that. That was a blessing in the long run. But anyway, I was busy building a new house out of cement block this time. And how you build a, a cement block house out in the jungle is take me the rest of the morning to explain. I won't get into that. I attempted it and I did it, but it's not easy. Anyway, this, this house, this block house was to have a bathroom in it. And because our bathroom for two years in that bamboo house had been a bucket in a closet. I wanted something better than that. So I built a brand new septic tank. Never built a septic tank in my life. To me, that, that septic tank was beautiful to me. I don't know how, if you know, except most of you don't look at one that way. But they, to me, that thing, we made that, I had all the plans. It was just perfect, big, nice, with holes up on the top, with covers on it and all that. And I covered it with dirt because we were coming to clean up around the house. And I had two pieces of equipment that were vital to me, absolutely vital. One was a Caterpillar D4 bulldozer, helping me push a six-mile road through the jungle to civilization. The only way we could get in was by plane. The other was a little Daihatsu 
dump truck, flatbed dump truck, could do anything. And I, my life depended on those two things. And so I brought the tractor driver over. I said, um, I want you to clean up around the house, push all this junk into a pile out here and get it out so we, uh, the house would look nice. But I said, uh, right now where I've got you standing, we're standing on the septic tank. You hear that? Yeah, yeah, boss, I hear. The, the, the septic tank is under here. We'd covered it with dirt. So I got a branch and I, I drew all the way around in the dirt. All the way around. Big, nice mark on the dirt. And I said, don't come anywhere near this with the tractor. Yes, boss, I understand. And I walked away. And I shouldn't have. <laughs> 20 minutes later, a runner came running to me. Reverend! Tractor in the septic tank! <laughs> I went back there and I couldn't believe my eyes. It was in there like a shoe in a box. Fit perfectly. <laughs> there weren't more than two or three inches on each side or the end. It just is sitting in there as beautiful as you could see. Unbelievable. And I walked, I, I, wa I couldn't look at it very long because I was, I don't know whether I was angry, I, I was upset. I walked away. I didn't yell at the tractor driver, I just walked away. Twenty minutes later, another runner came. This is the truth. I'm Job all over again. Reverend, die hot to the truck upside down in the river, your bridge broke. And it was true, and they were upside down in the river. Thank God they got out. But it, it, I had a crumpled Daihatsu truck upside down in the river and, and a tractor in a septic tank. <laughs> My two blessed pieces of equipment. I don't know why, how, I got a hold of my Bible, I have no idea, that, but I had my Bible in my hand, walk, I found myself walking across that airstrip, I was mad. Walked into this little bamboo house that was sitting on the other side, there was one chair in the house, it was vacant, and, uh, one of those chairs you sew together with bamboo or with whatever, and I plumped myself down in that, and I'm ashamed to say it, I took my Bible and I yanked it open, and I plopped myself in the, down in the chair and I plopped my Bible down. And I said, God, I'm out of here. And if you've got anything to say, you better say it quick, because I'm out of here. Uh, I'm sorry for that. And I looked down, and there was chapter 18. I'd been in the ministry, what, 15 years or so. Never read it. I, I would wonder if anybody here ever read Isaiah 18. Just seven verses. If you have your Bible, be sure you have that open because we're going to spend some time in that. And if you read it, if you happen to have read it, you would have just gone right on by because you wouldn't have understood a word that's there. That's why I didn't read it as a reading. I want to read it with, a, with understanding here. It takes an African to understand this, <laughs> along with the Holy Spirit, to understand this, to get this. And it begins like this. Uh, this, this is a part of, a, of the Bible for, from 13 through 22. It's the woes of the nations. Prophecy about the horror that is going to come to different nations. And right smack in the middle of those 8 or 12, 10, 10 12, uh, I forget which it is. But anyway, there's a center book, and that's this little 7 here. And it's not a woe. In my Bible, it's an alas. And my Bible reads, Alas, O land of whirring wings, which lies beyond the rivers of Ethiopia or Cush, it's the same thing, which sends envoys by the sea, even in papyrus vessels, on the surface of the waters, and they go out crying, go swift messengers to this people tall and smooth, to a people feared far and wide, a powerful and oppressive nation whose land 
the rivers divide. I read that and I didn't see a thing. So I read it again and again. And then my navigation experience in World War II, I was a navigator on a destroyer, the USS Maddox, and, uh, during World War II. I know maps. Back then we had to use maps. Now, even maps, you know, it's all done by GPS or something. But I know maps and I began to realize Isaiah is up there in Israel, which is up above North Africa, and he's looking down. And he's seeing a land of warring wings which lies beyond the rivers of Ethiopia. The rivers of Ethiopia are what? The blue and the white Nile. This is where they joined together at Ethiopia. He said, this land that I'm talking about is beyond that. Well, that's sub-Sahara Africa. My Africa. Black Africa. This is what he's prophesying about. And one of the other things that gives you a clue is it starts out on land of warring wings. What uh, insect has whirring wings? Mosquito, right? <laughs> and that's my country too, the land of mosquitoes. Everybody has a mosquito net. You don't have one here, but we do in sub-Sahara Africa. That's how we keep from getting malaria, which is even worse than Ebola, really, as far as killing people off. So he's identified it as beyond the rivers of Ethiopia, the land of warring wings. And then he says here, Go ye swift messengers. They've gone out as envoys. They've gone out looking, crying out, Come to our country. Go. Jesus said, Go ye into all the world. And they're saying, Go, come to our country. This land that is being described here. Go swift messengers to this nation, tall and smooth. That's the African people. People feared far and wide, powerful and oppressive nation. Whose land, this is the one that blew me. This land that the rivers divide. Sub-Sahara Africa is covered with huge rivers. You've got four Mississippi rivers, really, flowing across Africa, east to west or west to east. You've got the Congo. You've got the Zambezi. You've, that's the one that Livingston walked all the way from almost the Atlantic Ocean to the Indian Ocean on, discovered that river, then was looking for the Nile, discovered the Congo River, didn't know it because he thought it was the Nile, and he died on the shores of the Congo River, not knowing it was going to turn, make a left angle turn and empty in the Pacific rather than in the Mediterranean. There's that, and the Orange River as well, the Niger River, those rivers. You look at a map of Africa, and it's just sub-Saharan Africa, full of rivers. Isaiah knew that 2,600 years ago. Because God told him. That, and and it, it was Livingston in 1860 that discovered the first one of these rivers. Nobody knew these rivers existed there, except Isaiah. And people who read this with understanding, and I don't know if there were any. But to me, that is one of the greatest proofs of the truth of the scriptures. Is that here, this, here it is. You can get up on a satellite and see all of it now. But only Isaiah could see that as God spoke to him then. It's, so... The, the place is, is singled out, Sub-Saharan Africa. That's what this is about. And so then he goes on, and, and you would read this, and if you don't know the book of Revelation, if you don't know uh, Matthew 24, 25, you, you're going to have a hard time understanding 3, 4, 5, and 6 because it's a, a description of the last days. It's the trumpet blowing, the birds of prey eating the flesh, and so forth. It's all there. 
talking about the last days. First he talks about sub-Sahara Africa, and then he says the last days. And then you come to the last verse. Look at your Bibles. And I've got it uh, underlined, I've got it marked in orange, I've got it bracketed. At that time, at that time, what time? When the end comes, the last days, at that time, and who, come, who else comes besides the end times? The Lord Jesus, right? They're synonymous, synonymous. When the end comes, Christ comes. And he says, I'm not going to come back until you finish this job of getting this gospel to every nation, every creature. That's Matthew 24, 14. That's the verse we came out to Af Africa on. That's what moved us to come out here. To hurry his coming. When you do missions, you're hurrying his coming because he's not going to come until we finish the job. So that's another whole message. And so at that time, a gift of homage will be brought to the Lord of hosts from this people. Feared far and wide from this people. Powerful and oppressive nation whose land the rivers divide. And all of a sudden, my darkest day, that was my darkest day there, then that tractor went in there, became my brightest day, and I realized that Africa has this tremendous destiny. That they're going to be the ones who are going to be leading the parade when Christ comes back, because it's going to be the hot spot. And I'll mention that in just a minute, when Christ returns. And they're going to be eager to get out there to meet him and welcome him back at that time. That's the destiny Africa has. ABC's destiny is to raise up the Christian leaders it's going to take to help Africa attain this God-given destiny. And that's why when I found this out, my darkest day became my brightest day, and I said to the Lord, I'll, I'm, I'm, I'm here. I'm not running. I'm not going to go. I'm staying. And it was six months later or so that he gave the vision for the Bible college. there were colleges. There would have been none had I left. And I almost did. But it was Isaiah 18 that kept me there because it has a destiny. Uh, some people would say, well, you're saying that because you're a missionary in Africa. No, I'm not saying that. Other people are saying this. Um, at... Um, one of our uh, great uh, seminaries, Fuller Seminary down in, in Southern California. They have a great missions department and for the last 50 years they have been charting the center of Christianity, seeing where it is. And it started when they started 50 or 60 years ago after World War II. It began, of course, moving from Europe over to the United States. But 10 years ago, it began to turn. And today, it is on a steady, straight course, southwest, southeast, to sub-Sahara Africa. And they are saying, not me, that within the next 20 to 25 years, Africa will be the center of Christianity. Now that's not hard for us to believe because we're watching it happen right before our eyes. When I went to Malawi to spot it out, or Nell and I traveled over to the spy it out, really. We came back, I'm, I'm, I'm out of the PCA church, I'm a Presbyterian, but ABC, the, our mission organization is interdenominational. But uh, I found out when I got there, there were 600,000 Presbyterians in that little country. 600,000. Livingston did his homework when he planted churches there back in 1860 and 70. 
and brought missionaries. The first missionaries to go in the interior of Africa came into Malawi. And today they would be surprised that there are, uh, that when we went there, 600,000. We've been there 22 years. My PCA church has grown maybe a couple of hundred thousand since then. I don't know. It's pretty much leveled off right now. One million six hundred thousand Presbyterians in Malawi today. One million six hundred thousand. That's what's happening right before. We, we, we're watching this. We're bringing the students in. We, 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 take, not, we used to take about 60 or 70. We're up to where we take about 100 each semester. No, not quite that, 80 each semester. We have over 600 take our entrance examinations. And all of them are qualified to come academically. But we only can take that many. We'd like to take more. We can't afford it to take more. Up in Uganda, where we have our third college, it's all Anglican. Out of Idi Amin's, you know, Amin's persecution 25 years ago, 30 years ago. And that persecution restarted a revival that has lasted even up until today. And today you got to, when you go to an Anglican church, it's the most evangelical church you can find in, in Uganda. Their students came down, we were flooded with them down there, and they were the most evangelical church, uh, students we had at the college. And uh, when you want to get into an Anglican church in the morning for one of their first four or five services each morning, you've got to get there two hours ahead of time to be sure you get a seat somewhere along the line that morning. The greatest proof to me uh, was Franklin Graham of Samaritan's Purse, Billy Graham's son. Uh, he helped greatly, and I don't have time to get into that, in rebuilding the college after the war. It was all broken down. Now it's built up better than it was before. And they helped us tremendously because they began to use some of our graduates, and they, and they, were, they were overwhelmed by their abilities. And, and he came and he said to us, we're going to make you, when we come here to Africa with this work, we're going to make you the first priority because we've got to get that college back up again and begin to get these leaders for missions and for ourselves. And after that, he put on a crusade down in Monrovia, just like his dad did, and he gave an altar call. And I'd never seen this before in my life. They ran to receive Christ, thousands of them. That's my Africa. And you know what I hope? Running comes into this. When this happens, I, I, want, I want to be there with them. I don't know whether I'll be up there when it happens or down here. It looks more and more like it's going to be up there. <laughs> but I, I want to come down and enjoy and join them as they're running to Christ. I want to run with them shoulder to shoulder and be shouting out as we read here hallelujah to our Lord of Lords our King of Kings the Lord Jesus Christ and I would hope that would be so with all of us who've taken a part in helping them find and reach their destiny let's pray Father thank you and we ask God that you bless missions Africa, this church, thank you for the gift of the Holy Spirit that empowers us not only to understand but to do something about getting this gospel to the uttermost parts of the world. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Oh, Jack. How do you like this? Hallelujah, Presbyterian.